this constant randomizing method for measuring sigma p prime from a laboratory consolidation test. Um, in an ideal world, we would have an elastic loading period, and then we would turn a very sharp corner and reach a plastic loading, an elastoplastic loading period. So we would transition from going along the C sub R line to the C sub C line. Uh, in real life, it's not so simple because there's sample disturbance, the soil doesn't perfectly conform to our expectation for how it should behave. So Casa Grande developed a method for um, accounting for that fact and finding what is sigma p prime based on imperfect laboratory test data. And so we'll go through that now. So here, I've, what I've done is plotted a bunch of points on this plot. When you plot consolidation data, always include symbols. You want to know exactly where those stress points were. It's okay to include a line along with it, um, but be careful about using that curvy line fit, like the spline fit in um, Excel. And I'll, I'll show you why here in just a second. So what I'm going to do is now draw in that line, um, this. I, I kind of, I'm going to draw it by hand, obviously, but, you know, if I'm plotting data, I just use the uh, straight line fit, not the curvy line fit. Um, you always want to make sure that the fit that you put in there is not implying things about the data that are unreasonable. So uh, one thing that I'll point out, if you were to use a curvy line fit, like that little spline thing with the symbols here, it would mess up right here. It would do something like this. And, you know, that's totally unreasonable. That's not what the soil did. Once we get to this point right here, we actually do turn a sharp corner. So if you wanted to, I guess you could use the curvy line fit just for these data points, and then you could put in a separate line segment from this point to there using the curvy line fit. That would be okay. Just make sure that you're not implying something unreasonable. All right, so anyway, we've got this line drawn in here. Um, all right, so what we're going to do, that's that's already step one of Casa Grande's procedure. So let's write those steps down here. Step one, draw a consolidation curve. All right, so for step two, what we're going to do is find the point of maximum curvature. And you know what? I'm going to actually make this point a little bit lower. I drew it a little bit too good. I'm going to make it like right there. This is kind of more like a normal looking curve. Yeah, that's more like something you might see from a real laboratory experiment. So what we're going to do now is find the point of maximum curvature. So that's the point where um, this, this laboratory consolidation curve is changing the most quickly, where the slope of the curve is changing the most quickly. So uh, what I'll do is identify that point maybe in green, and I'm going to put it like maybe right here. It's, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, and you can try multiple points of maximum curvature because it's always a little difficult to um, figure out. So I'm going to label that point A, and then we'll come down here and do step two, and I'll draw it in green to make it clear that it goes with that previous point. So step two, find point of maximum So then what we do is draw um, a, a tangent to the consolidation curve at point A. So I'm going to make that green also. I'll come in here and just draw a line that is tangent to point A. Or you know what, maybe I'll make it red. <laughs> I'm going to try and keep it so that the sequence is uh, all different colors. So that was not perfectly tangent. Let's start a little higher. So then the red one, step three, draw a tangent through point A. All right, and then number four, we'll draw a horizontal line through point A. 
So I'm going to make that a black line, like this one. Here's a horizontal line. Um, and then we can come down here, step four. Draw a horizontal line. Okay, and then step five, we need to draw a line that bisects the two lines that we've already drawn. So right in the middle, I'll draw it right there. Um, step five, whoops, using the wrong tool here. That was cool though. Step five, draw a line that bisects. Six, what we're going to do is backward extrapolate the, um, let's see, I'm on green now. We're going to backward extrapolate the normal consolidation line. So here's, you know, that's kind of like the normally consolidated region right there, where we are clearly in the high pressure elastoplastic portion of the curve. So here's six. extrapolate the uh, normal consolidation line or NCL. Okay, and then uh, the rest of it is easy. Now we just need to interpolate sigma P prime and it's going to be right at this point. So I'll draw a straight line down and there it is. Um, this is sigma P prime. Notice that sigma P prime doesn't actually lie on the consolidation curve, right? It's a little bit higher than the consolidation curve, and that's because of sample disturbance. So step seven, then, is um, sigma P prime lies at the intersection of um, five and six. So anyway, there it is. That's Casa Grande's procedure, and there is some indication of this in your textbook. All right, and now what I'm going to do is switch to this Excel um, document, and, and I just want to show you the way that uh, some different plays look in terms of their consolidation curves. So uh, this plot shows some, this is figure 8.9a in your textbook, and it's showing a bunch of um, nearly normally consolidated clays and silts. And what you can see is that there's a pretty big range of void ratios here, and there's some effective consolidation stresses. And you can see in these curves that oftentimes it's not very easy to figure out where the maximum pass pressure is, right? It's not a perfect sharp corner, and there's some curve to it, because real soil just doesn't behave the way that we think it should. Uh, here's an example of some of some clay till. So this is t this is glacial till. It's been underneath a, a big glacier. Notice that the void ratio is really low, right? In the previous slide, we were dealing with void ratios up around 1.3, much higher, although that's not even really that high of a void ratio. 0.3 is really a low void ratio for clay. So this is really been compressed a lot underneath that glacier. And this is showing Casa Grande's method for getting uh, sigma P. Then here's ones that show clay tills with different types of sampling. And uh, this is something to be really careful about. The, the way that we get the sample out of the ground matters a lot. So a uh, block sample is the best kind. That's where you go cut away a block of soil and carefully bring it back to the lab, and then you trim part of the clay out of the middle of this big block. So there's very little disturbance. So that's shown there on the top. And um, then if you do a borehole method and you push a tube sample, let's say you get a thin wall tube, you push that thin wall tube into the ground so that the clay doesn't really get remolded very much, and then you cut the tube apart and trim the sample and then do the test. You get a little bit more disturbance that way. And disturbance tends to make these lines come down a little bit. So the top one is the best, the borehole one is second best. And then there's the 100% the 
disturbed or remolded soil, and it's quite a bit lower, so it has different consolidation properties. And the reason why I mention this is, is that um, in Southern California practice, we tend to use a lot of really bad sampling techniques. Um, instead of pushing a thin wall tube into the ground to get a consolidation sample, a lot of the time we drive a very thick walled sampler using a 140 pound hammer. And it basically destroys the soil as it's being driven in. And then we do consolidation tests on those soil samples for some reason. It doesn't make any sense, but this is how we do it. This is how a lot of firms do it. So you're going to get wrong behavior. You're going to get uh, behavior out of that soil that doesn't represent what's happening in the field. So you want to try and get the best possible sample that you can. Um, here's another one that I'll show. You know, if you have any kind of sensitive clay, uh, disturbance can be a really big deal. So this this is that kind of clay that is in the book where it's a solid cylinder and then you remold it and it flows like a liquid. So leta clay is a sensitive clay. <clears throat> if you do a good job sampling it, you don't pre-disturb it and turn it into a liquid. Uh, you'll get a consolidation curve that is pretty flat at the top and then suddenly drops down right when you disturb it enough to create that liquid form. If you disturb it a lot beforehand, you'll basically turn it into a liquid and it'll reconsolidate 